We had a great time in the 9am service. We're in our Future is Family series. So I would like to speak into parenting today. And, and I, I really do realize that this is a topic that triggers a lot of people and can have a lot of emotion around it and negativity. And by no means this morning is my desire to condemn or rub salt in a wound. When I minister, I, I'm constantly thinking of two groups of people, the one that needs instruction. We all need instruction, but also the ones that need redemption. So I don't just speak to those who need to be redeemed. I also speak to those who are on the precipice of life and, and give them instructions so they don't make the same mistakes that I've made or people who have gone before have made. And so I, I can't think of a topic that needs more wisdom around it than child raising. I have four children. My eldest is 26. My youngest is 13. I had my first child at 19. And trust me, I was grabbing all the wisdom I could. And I want to tell you today, if, you, if, you, if you're here, I want you to open your heart to the wisdom of the Lord today and grab what he has for you as you go about this thing called parenting. And if you're here and you don't have children or you're in the grandparent stage, this is still so relevant to you. I remember at the age of 16, sitting in Pastor Jürgen's Bible college class, sneaking in, and I had a marriage and family uh, lesson or lecture, and it was the most interesting thing in the world to me. And I thank God for that stolen moment that actually helped set me up to be a parent. And who would have known three years from that date? So don't tune out. If you don't have kids, don't tune out. At some point in your life, you may be called upon to be a surrogate parent to someone also. So these these points and this message is going to be so relevant to you. So I was thinking about parenting and uh, just the way that our society has approached in more modern times raising children. And you'll hear a lot of children just need to be loved. We just need to love our kids. We just need to love them. And it's so true. Our children need to be encouraged. They need to be nurtured. They need to be looked in the eye by both their mother and their father and told that they're important, that they're special, that they're wanted, that they're loved, where to be their greatest cheerleaders. But we can't stop just there because that's, that's the way society has kind of done things. We just want to love our children. We just want to love. But when you look around at the fruit of loving kids the world's way, it's, it's not awesome. We've actually never had a generation of children that's more anxious, that's more miserable, more selfish. So perhaps there's a gap. Maybe there's something between love the feeling and love the action that we're missing out on. So the title of my message today is this, how to raise children that are happy, fun, interesting, and responsible, and who have a much better chance of not being wildly dysfunctional. you start there. I need, it needs a little bit of a disclaimer because at the end of the day, It's our job to raise our children while they're with us, but when they go, they're going to make their own choices. So I just want to take a little bit of pressure off you today. No perfect parents in this room. There was one family that had a perfect parent, God, Adam and Eve, and and they rebelled and got kicked out of home, and then their children, one of them killed the other one. So I just want to just relax. It's all good. Condemnation leaves in Jesus' name. I'm going to start by reading this scripture. This is going to be the lens by which everything I say is going to flow out of. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, teaching him to seek God's wisdom and will for his abilities and talents. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. There are many facets to love. Cuddles and encouragement is part of it, but it's not the whole picture. A big part of loving and leading children and raising children is training. Training. What are we doing, mums and dads? We are training our children how to behave and thrive when they leave our home. 
So we're sending out into the world boys and girls who are healthy contributors to society, not menaces to society. So I just want to preface this message with it may trigger you. I was triggered right now. I triggered myself. I offended myself. So I want you to just kind of settle in and just say to yourself, Jesus loves me, this I know. It's all good. We're going to get through it together. But I just want you to receive the wisdom of the Lord today. So I'm going to give six qualities or six keys of things that I believe we've been missing in our modern day parenting and the way to really raise and release children that are a blessing to everybody around them and a blessing to themselves. You ready? Amen. Amen. Okay, point number one, teach your children to be responsible with their feelings. Now, feelings are good. Feelings are important that children need to be able to express themselves without fear of condemnation. And there definitely was an era where children were uh, repressed and suppressed and you're not allowed to feel, you just behave. And thank God we've righted that. But I believe in some ways we've let the pendulum swing a little bit too far. So we want you to express how you feel. And now how are we going to take personal responsibility for those feelings? Let me give you an example. In our current generation, we have a lot of confusion, especially around gender. Imagine how different things would look like if parents didn't just say, just tell me how you feel and what you're feeling, but then continued that conversation around, okay, now what is the right thing to do? Now what does God's word say? Now what's the truth? Now what decision based on these feelings are going to lead to life and not death? When I was a little girl, my parents were um, wonderful Christian parents. I was raised in a Christian home. I was one of five girls. And I, I swear, I was not allowed to be miserable. As much as I tried to be, my mom would look, if I was like walking around the house like, like I'd been baptized in vinegar and lost my last friend, <laughs> kicking around, kicking the dog, she'd, she'd look at me and she'd say, Leanne, Edith, put a smile on your face, face, get outside and play with your friends. She didn't even let me acknowledge my feeling of absolute desperation and depression. She actually said to me, you know what, you, you can have control over the way you feel. You can, I acknowledge that feeling. I'm not feeling awesome. Now, what am I going to do about it? I'm going to take some responsibility. Here's what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. He that is patient is better than a mighty man, self-control. And he that subdues himself, in other words, I get the worst, most base, most depressive feelings, and I am master over them, they are not master over me, is greater than the one who takes a city. This is some high praise right here. The Bible is telling us right here that someone who has control over their own spirit is more Mighty than a warrior. And my parents, they wouldn't let me mope around. And it's amazing. They're like, put a smile on your dog. Go out and play with your friends. Go have some fun. And, and I often think that childhood blues and depression, if it's not, of course, over some kind of legitimate trauma, is easily fixed by saying, come on, snap out of yourself. Go outside and ride your bike. <laughs> But if we indulge our children in those, oh, and let's just have a one-hour conversation about how you feel. <laughs> and sometimes those things will be appropriate, but more often than not, they need leadership. They need training. I know you feel sad, bad, angry, tired, but come on. Let's get on with life. We got this. And you know what? It put me in really good stead as an adult to actually be someone who could harness themselves, their own spirits, and not succumb or placate the worst things that I was thinking or feeling. When we moved to America almost 17 years ago, I remember having times of, of feeling blue and depressed. I'd left everything I knew. I'd left my parents, my sisters, my nieces, my nephews, all my friends. 
uh, moved to a country that was very foreign to me to, to build the church. We, we didn't have any friends. This predated Dr. Matt and Michaela. It was just Pastor Jürgen and I and our three little boys. And I remember every day about lunchtime, the reality of what we'd done would hit me and I'd get depressed and I'd feel sad. And I'd go upstairs away from my kids and away from my husband and I'd lie on my bed and I would vent my feelings appropriately to God. And I would have a moment, I would let myself be sad and mourn the loss of my family and friends, but I would say, but God, I, I just know in a year it's going to feel like home and that things are going to feel better than they've been. And then I would reassure myself, I would speak to my own soul, and then I'd walk downstairs and I'd be happy mom again. Now, now you might think that, that, oh, look at you, you're being deceptive. No, it's called discretion. Not everybody should, should be subjected to our bad moods and our bad feelings. I know that's not popular preaching right now, but just like you wouldn't go outside without flossing, brushing your teeth and using mouth aid, mouth rinse aid to not inflict your bad breath on everybody. <laughs> the same thing can be said for a mood. Just like you put on deodorant and shower and use soap, hopefully, so you don't <laughs> assault society with body odor. We can, we can do the same thing with our moods and our spirits. Right. Don't let your feelings dictate how you behave. <laughs> you let your behavior Tell your feelings who's boss. King David put it this way. He said, oh, my soul, why are you so downcast within me? I will yet praise God. Don't teach your kids that their feelings rule. Encourage them in the fact that they have the seeds of God on the inside of them, self-control. There is a time and a season for venting, for tears, for falling apart, and usually, typically, it's not in public. Don't take your mood with you. And you walk in the door and it's like, oh, the storm cloud arrived. <laughs> my, um, my week was very interesting. On Monday, Valentine's night, my husband Jürgen took myself and my son and his wife and my daughter out for dinner. We had a great time. And walking back to the car, I wasn't paying attention. And walking into the parking lot, I didn't see that a robotic arm had come up and then it came down and karate chopped me so hard on the head. And then I saw stars and I was spinning and then I collapsed and was knocked unconscious for three minutes. This happened Monday. I'm fine though. So then I come to and I wake up and I swear every paramedic in Park City was surrounding me. I feel like such a drama queen. And so I had to go to hospital and the whole thing. And uh, we were only there for three days with our kids. And I was determined that I was going to go home and I was going to be fun mom, that we were going to have a good time. I wasn't going to let my personal situation rain on everybody else's parade. Now, flash forward to Friday. You'd think that would be enough in one week. Friday, I'm driving to Coronado to celebrate a girlfriend's birthday. And I get rear-ended by an ambulance. <laughs> An ambulance. I mean, in many ways, it's kind of like the perfect scenario because they're both the villain and the savior. <laughs> I, I would have been well looked after. But I, I'm on my way to this party and I get rear-ended and whole thing and some damage. I got a bit of a headache. But I'm determined. My friend, she had a birthday in January. She had to cancel it because she had COVID. We were now only able to celebrate it. I wasn't going to walk in there and make it all about me. I'm like, you know what? It's all good. Let's go have some fun on Coronado Beach. I want to really encourage you today to train your children, yes, to feel, yes, to express what they feel, but to do it in a responsible way and train them to choose God, choose life, choose right, that they are in control of their emotions. I wonder if a lot of the chaos and the confusion that we're dealing with in our society today is simply a fact the, because of the fact that too many parents have taught their children how to feel but not think. Hello. We, can, we can do it. Come on, we're going to raise healthy, well-balanced children that have a much greater chance of not being wildly dysfunctional. 
Don't make excuses for your kids. Kids are going to behave badly. I, it, it is what it is, especially little toddlers. You, you're right in the midst of Hell Week training day. It is what it is. And they're going to throw some tantrums and they're going to do things that they shouldn't do and there's no judgment. My kids did it, your kids will do it. But those moments, don't make excuses. Train them. Train them. You don't get to punch Billy in the face because you're tired. <laughs> oh, he only did that because he's tired and he needs to go to bed. No. Yeah. You shouldn't have pu- I know you're tired, but you don't get to punch Billy in the face. Yeah. If you keep doing that when you're 35, you're going to get thrown in prison. Yeah. You don't get to throw yourself on the floor and writhe around like you're having an epileptic fit because you're hungry. If you do that when you're older, they're going to lock you up and throw away the key. (laughs) Don't make excuses. And these things translate into adult life. That's why Solomon, in his divine wisdom, train up a child in the way they should go. And when they are older, they will not depart from it. You, you teach your youngster how to choose feelings over taking responsibility for them and doing what's right and what may be difficult, then you raise teenagers who think, I'm sad, I'm just going to take something to feel better right, right. instead of choosing the better thing. You, you don't get to take drugs because you're sad. Right. You, you don't get to do that. There is another way, another solution. I'm going to be responsible for the way that I feel. How you going? You're hanging in there? All right. Point number two, teach your children to obey you. Now, we don't like that word. We don't like that word, but I'm telling you, an obedient child is a happy child. A child that is given boundaries is a happy, well-balanced child that will be invited to play dates that won't be excluded from the social gatherings, the family won't be blacklisted from the church barbecue. (laughs) When you give your children boundaries to flourish in, and can I just say to mums and dads here right now, you actually don't need to give your children an explanation for a command. When they're writing their own checks, paying their own bills, living in their own house, they can call the shots. Till then... You got to do what I say. And mind you, it's important to note also that because I said so is actually a really appropriate answer to a question. In fact, the more detail you give, the more conversation, the more you explain yourself, the more you invite an argument. Be, be confident in what you're saying. And you don't need to do it and be mean. I'm not talking about being mean or harsh or ruling with an iron fist. You can say it nicely. Because I said so. Oh, but why, Mom? Please, why? But no, but Billy. Because I said so. You can say it with a smile. A red flag for me is when I hear parents say, I just want to be my child's friend. And, And listen, I will say this. Friendship is a reward. That, that we should get to enjoy after the hard work, or as we say in Australia, the hard yakka of doing the job of parenting and training. In that season, they're under our roof and under our care. It's a reward for, for that. But if your main goal as you're raising your children is to be their friend, you, you, you're just not going to parent them right. Let me put it to you this way. If my greatest desire as your pastor would be for you to love me, I wouldn't be preaching this message right now. (laughs) I'd be talking about something that felt so much better for everyone, but my position requires it of me. And can I say to you today, if your greatest desire is that your children love and or like you, then you love yourself more than you love them. I'm going to be honest with you. I know that hurts. I know it hurts, so I'll just say it one more time. (laughs) If you're... If your greatest priority is that your children love or like you, 
because they're going to, their moods, their feelings are going to change from day to day depending on what you do. Then you love yourself more than you love them. Here's what the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 24. If you don't punish your children, you don't love them. See, our broken view of love that society has grasped, on, grasped onto, children just need love, is not producing good fruit because their love doesn't include discipline. Their love doesn't include consequences for right and wrong. And if we don't teach our children obedience to their parents who love them, guess what? Society's going to teach them. If you don't teach your kids that bad choices lead to bad consequences, society will teach them. And sadly, society is a lot more cruel, way more cruel, much, much crueler than you are. So they're going, they're going to teach your children a lesson or consequences through rejection. They're not getting invited to parties. They're excluded from the play dates. They're getting their butt kicked out of the Sunday school class. And even when they're older, incarceration. It's so important how we raise our children, how we train them to thrive when they've left our care. The Bible says this in Proverbs 19, 18. Discipline your children while they are young enough to learn. God has entrusted something so precious to you and they were his babies before they were yours. The Bible says that God skillfully knit them. They're his children first, and then he entrusted them to you. Train them while there is still time. Discipline them while there is still time, where they're young, young enough to learn. If you don't, you are helping them destroy themselves. What language the Bible is using. Put your hand up if you want to destroy your child. None of you do. Of course you don't. No parent has a baby hoping or wishing that they'll train wreck their life. And yet it happens every day because we don't train them. We don't create boundaries for them. We make excuses for them. We don't discipline them because we think discipline is cruel. Discipline is a life saver, literally. Now, now, there are a lot of schools of thought on this, to spank or not to spank. Spanking worked on me. I got spanked every day till I was about eight. And I'm the most functional person I know. <laughs> it didn't hurt me. I mean, I, I grew up in the era, maybe some of you can relate, in the 80s where, where other people's parents spanked you. <laughs> I got spanked by three different neighbours on the same day. And they'd have a, a flip-flop in one hand and a cigarette in the other. Now get on home. That was, the, that was the era. No, no, we don't hit. Jesus wouldn't hit. He made a whip out of ropes. I mean, come on, America. And spank it. Now I get it. There are some people you have trauma from your past, and I don't want to mess with you. If you don't trust yourself or it triggers you too much, God bless you. Then you work out with your spouse what a, an agreed consequence delivery system is. So, so oftentimes the withholding of a, a, a pleasure it does a good job. So you, you get no device. You get no television. You don't get to play with your friends. Your Lego is going bye-bye for two nights. And that's an eternity for a kid. So, so make sure that the time frame to which they are losing that, that pleasure is appropriate and uh, that it'll make a difference. But we can't not discipline our children. We have to discipline our children. And then don't threaten and not follow through. I, I don't know, have you been to the mall? Jimmy, if you do that one more time, I'm going to paddle your heart. And then Jimmy does it one more time and nothing happens. Oh my gosh, I remember just even as a young mom, and I had three boys, and boys will wear you out. 
and it's good and you don't want them to, to lose um, neither male nor female. You don't want them to lose their mischievous sparkle and their fun and kids should be a little bit noisy and, and rambunctious and kind of run around and do the things that kids do. But at the same time, there has to be consequences for bad, disrespectful behavior. So I would, I would travel, I would walk around town and I would have a wooden spoon in my handbag. <laughs> and I was, mom was packing heat, I'm just saying. And if I'm honest, I did not have to spank my children, always on the bottom, by the way, and usually privately, sometimes they just did not deserve that benefit. But usually, like the preferred, the Bible says, discipline your children carefully. Yeah. I'd take them into the bathroom, give them a few taps on the butt. Yeah. If you do that again, mommy will spank you more. <gasps> By the time they were six or seven, I rarely had to spank them again. Yeah. It's amazing. It works. Don't let your fear or your trauma have you raising children that society will reject. I was in Luna Grill yesterday. And I was having lunch by myself, and there was a family, and the little boy was just commandeering his parents, standing up on the seat, yelling, crying, yeah, you know, that kind of like obnoxious behavior. And come on, Billy, eat your lunch, no, yeah. like all this kind of thing, like disturbing the peace. But the best part was we didn't have to go home with him. I felt sorry for his parents who now have to go home, but... The tragedy was I could see in the eyes of the father this absolute exasperation. He didn't like his own kid. Don't raise children you don't even like. Because you can guarantee if you don't like them, ain't nobody like those kids. <laughs> Nobody's liking those kids. His father was ashamed of him. And I could see that he resented his wife because at some point there'd been a conversation, no, honey, you can't, no, we can't. And for some reason, he didn't take control and bring leadership. And discipline isn't harsh. When done God's way, it's love. Right. Yes. It may not fit society's version of love. Right. Society's version of love is, no, we don't do that. We hug them, we cuddle them, we love them. Okay, please get a broader definition of what love is because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, love does not rejoice in evil. Right. When your kids are doing evil, and trust me, kids know how to do some evil. It's your job as mom or dad to bring correction. Correct them. Amen, Leanne. <laughs> Okay, third point, you're all still breathing? Yes. Good. Teach your children how to be fun and interesting. Yeah. Let me tell you how you do that. You don't rule your household through your fears. Right. Yeah. Fearful people are not fun and they're not interesting. Yeah. And something happened, there was a collateral damage that happened when we ingested the future is female and masculinity is toxic. We got the fruit of an over-mothered society where everything's dangerous. We can't have fun because fun is risky. I remember once reading in a parenting magazine that you shouldn't dress your children in clothing that had floral patterns because they could get stung by bees. Now, how many people have watched little floral children running down the street surrounded by swarms of bees? Has that ever happened to you in your life? No. But, but too many of us have let fear become the driving force in our parenting and it's ruining our kids. And didn't we just have a masterclass of that the last two years? The fruit of fear? Little babies that weren't allowed to play with their friends? What? We're masked up. I feel sorry for your kids if you did that. I wish they were raised in my house, and I mean it. That's wicked. It's cruel. Don't you project your fears on your children. You look to God, who is the healer, and say, God, I don't want to 
repeat the dysfunctions from my past. I want to raise children that are fun and interesting. And I'm not talking about being reckless. I'm talking about being fearless. There's a big difference. Not reckless, fearless. I, I want to live a long time. I don't want to die. But the question that drives me in my parenting is I want my children to fully live. And, and I, I wonder if this generation's obsession with video games has come from the fact that we have so sanitized and ruined our world because of fear that a pretend fantasy world is more exciting than the real world. Could that be it? Are you parenting your children out of fear and therefore crushing their spirit of adventure? I remember growing up, and maybe it was because I grew up in Australia, and I mean, we'd wake up every morning and there was always something that either wanted to eat us, bite us, sting us, or drown us. <laughs> right, Carolyn? So like going to school was like running the gauntlet. <laughs> I, it was a different world. I, I, my parents did not even know till I was, till it was dark. They didn't even know where I was. Right? How many? And you might say, well, the world's changed. Yes, it has. We changed it. We changed it through our fears. We changed it through a constant narrative of we just don't want to die. Something could happen to you. Yes, something could happen to you. But think about it in the positive. Do you know how many adventures I had as a kid? the most amazing adventures, many of which my parents know nothing about. Are you raising fearful children? I'm grateful for a husband who has not allowed a spirit of fear to go uncontested in our home. And man, emerge man, you got this. Masculinity is not toxic by any stretch of the imagination. It is the greatest door opener. It is the greatest provider, protector. It is the greatest conduit to raise children that know how to live life to the full. What a whammy we've been sold, right? The greatest war on America has been the war on men. And we gobbled it up. And we took the future as female and we took to toxic masculinity. We tossed masculine strength out and we raised weak, insipid children that don't know how to live life and they're miserable and they're scared. And in the name of Jesus, I say enough. Enough, 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 enough. It is enough now. It is enough now. It's time to change your negative worldview and deal with whatever issue in you that does not trust God. What if they get sick? What if they die? You can't be absorbed by what if they die. That is not the question that should drive you. Are you training your children to live life well? I'm not talking about being reckless and taking silly risks. I'm talking about living fearlessly. My husband won't let us be fearful. I have tried to be fearful. I have tried and I have failed. And it will be every woman's battle. By the way, men, I'm going to just talk to you for a second. Your wife, it's kind of within her genetic makeup to be a little... Uh, 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 uh. There's a reason women are not allowed at a merch. If they, if they saw that running the gauntlet thing, it would be a literal feminine stampede. Where are the children? <laughs> Leave them be, mama. Let the boys become men. Trade in the skinny jeans for some Wranglers. <laughs> Just this week, our family was in Salt Lake City at our Salt Lake campus, and Jürgen has deemed it. He has decreed that now we have a campus in Salt Lake City, we are gonna be a family of skiers. He, he has not factored at all the fact that I'm terribly uncoordinated 
and have major real level trauma about skiing. I, I just, for some reason, I couldn't do it. I was like Zoolander, I couldn't turn left. And every time I tried, I would fall over and knock myself out. And that can only happen to somebody so many times before it starts to affect them, right? So I have this massive fear around skiing. And he's like, babe, we're gonna do it. We're gonna be a skiing family. And we're, we're like going up in the lift, the chairlift. I'm arguing with him the whole way. I'm all up in his business. You are a faith bully. <laughs> That's what you are, a faith bully. I don't have to be good at everything. He's like, who said good? I just don't want you to have a spirit of fear. I'm not gonna let fear win. And that made me madder because that fear was now manifesting. <laughs> but then I'm up there, so I have to get down. And I honestly, I was so petrified. And my husband's actually a beautiful teacher. He's like, Leanne, you can do this. This is just fear. Oh, it was true. I hated him, but it was true. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I could do this, shaking, and then I'm turning, and then he's like, babe, big, do an S. Don't try to go that way, go this way. And I'm, and before you know it, I mean, prior to that, those little kids, like annoying little hornets would come down <laughs> at warp speed. And I'd have my stick like, oh no, you didn't. But like they mocked me and taunted me with their fearlessness. But after two days of having my husband in his masculine strength and health contest that spirit of fear that wanted to take up residence, I was whoosh, now I'm not going to be an Olympian, but I conquered my fears. I conquered my fears. Teach your children how to be fun and interesting. Our family loves Indian food. My seven-year-old daughter at the time, who she's now 13, hated it. And every time we went to Indian, she would cry. She, she was not even trying to not offend the Indian cooks. She'd be sitting at the table, blubbery, I hate this food and it doesn't smell good. And they're like. But Jürgen persisted. I'm not going to let you eat chicken nuggets till you're 21. You're going to like it. This is good food. I'm going to make you fun and interesting. And in order for you to do that, you're going to have to do some things you don't want to do. You're gonna to have to challenge yourself in ways you do not wanna be challenged. And guess who now loves Indian food? <laughs> Zoe Matezias. Teach your children how to be fun and interesting. I'm telling you, anxious parents produce anxious children. And in the age of anxiety, we have to teach our children to be resilient. Yeah. Yeah. They're gonna be okay. They're gonna be okay. Turn off CNN. Stop listening to all those parenting pods that tell you one day from the next, the next thing that is dangerous. I, I read an article about how you, wouldn't, you shouldn't let your kids go to the beach because there's germs in sand. <laughs> Heaven help us all. But the sad thing is people are reading that, they are ingesting it, and then they're becoming these ridiculous parents who raise these insipid, pale, overly sunscreened, overhydrated children. <laughs> who can't go two feet without a snack. Eh, I never got a snack. There were some days I didn't even get to eat. <laughs> and oh, here's a snack. And it's like, oh, the baby, and now we need like goldfish. Start. What is, what is this snack phenomena and this, the water bottles with the smiley face, frowny face, please. If you're thirsty, drink. If you're hungry, eat. <laughs> Our family went on road trips, not kidding, that were like 12 hours long. We would sit in the car, no air conditioning, no radio, no food. And if we complained, we got a backhander. <laughs> oh, she is hungry. She will be fine. Okay, point number four. Teach your children how to navigate disappointment well. Disappointments will happen. Look at me, I, I want to say this to you truly and honestly, very seriously. Your children, as wonderful 
and special as they are, will get rejected. They will experience disappointments in life. They will not be included sometimes in the party and it won't be fair. They won't get picked for the sports team. They will experience hardships. In those moments, wherever it is appropriate and possible, do not fight their battles for them. Train them. Yes. Train yes. them. I went to a school, I went to school with a young woman who was a friend of mine whose mother was constantly down the school, piping off at the principal. I heard that you said, and then the teacher, well, why did you give my daughter a seat? Or, or the coach, well, my daughter deserves a spot. And, and she was always running to her daughter's defense, fighting her do daughter's battles, turning up to Sunday school and piping off to the Sunday school teacher about her, her, her daughter's life or mis perceived mistreatment. She would call up her friends and give them a piece of her mind. Like, it was insane. She, she taught her daughter how to be a woman who didn't know how to cope with life, who had no resilience, none whatsoever. She was what they would call these days a snowplow parent. So we have surpassed the helicopter parent. <laughs> And now we have the generation of snowplow parents. I am going to remove every obstacle from my child's way so they never have to experience a bad day. No disappointment, no failure, no rejection. I'm going to take care of everything. You know what? You're going to raise a weakling. And, and the sad thing about my friend, her mother ended up passing away. And I have no, no joy in telling you that woman now is morbidly obese terribly depressed and doesn't know how to function in society. Her mother did this to her. Contrast that with my parents. I remember one day I was in high school, probably eighth grade, and it was the last day of the school year before we broke for summer break, Christmas break in Australia. And everybody was mucking around and throwing things through the classroom, just having fun. And I had one of the chalkboard dusters. Remember when we had those? And I tossed it and I meant to hit another student, but it boinked the teacher on the head really hard. <laughs> now, I like to have fun, but I don't want to hurt anybody. I, I certainly didn't mean it. And understandably, she was ropeable, right? Who did this? You went and got the principal. Every, of course, my friends were a bunch of snitches. Be angry. <laughs> And so I'm dragged in and it was the end of the school year and the bell's about to ring and he's like, I don't have time to discipline you now, but when you come back from vacation, you're going to get it. I'm going to make an example out of you. And so I go home and I tell my mum about it. I'm like, mum, you'll never guess what happened. And I didn't mean it. I swear I was just playing and it was meant to hit Billy on the head, but I got the teacher and I'm going to get in so much trouble and can't you do something? It's not my fault. I didn't mean it. She's like, Leanne, I, I, I believe you. I, I know you're not the kind of person who's going to try to knock a teacher out with a duster. <laughs> but I can't fix this. But she said, you know what, you can. Why don't you pray? Amen. Now, I didn't get much peace. <laughs> Summer was not awesome. You know, I'd have fun, then I'd think about the impending doom of what would happen when I went back to school and had to go to Mr. Hambly's office. But then on the first day of school, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready. But the whole time I'd been praying, oh, God, oh, God, please don't let me get into trouble. Please don't let him make an example out of me. I don't even know what that meant at that particular juncture of life. But I remember walking to school and walking in, and Mr. Hambly from across the assembly just goes, Leanne Gray, don't throw dusters anymore. <laughs> that was it. That was it. Leave some room for God to move in your child's life. Don't go rescue him from every. Let him learn that sometimes life is hard and difficult. But you've got an advocate in heaven and you're going to get through. You're going to be okay. Oh, it's character building too. Don't teach your kids to be a bunch of victims. One thing I hear a lot in in church is people say, well, I came and nobody said hi to me. And I say, well, did you say hi to anyone? 
Oh, uh, no. I mean, we literally have people with high on their shirts. I'm... Don't, don't teach your kids to be victims. Overcomers, you're going to be okay. Life is going to be cruel sometimes. The Bible says in Matthew 5, verses 44 to 45, for God makes it so he rises his son on the evil and on the good. Jerks are going to get sunshine sometimes. And it sucks. And he sends his rain on the just and the unjust. In other words, Get an umbrella, people, because whether you're good or you're bad, sometimes you're going to have to experience some rain and some wet weather. Can we do this? We're we're not going to raise snowflakes anymore, are we? Come on. And again, I'm not talking about mean. I'm not talking about the times when it's appropriate for a mother or father to step in. And I know you know that. So don't try to make it what I'm not saying. But I want you to see, I want you to see that hardship produces character in your children that a worry-free, stress-free, obstacle-removed life will never give them. And one day you will die, hopefully before your children. What legacy are you leaving them? You're going to make it. You're going to get through. Life can be cruel sometimes, but God is good and you're going to make it. Point number five. Wow, I'm way over time. Geez, sorry, everyone. Teach your children to be honourable. Honourable. In Luke 6.40, it says, A student is not above the teacher, but everyone when he has been fully trained. There's that word. Everyone when he has been fully trained. Good, healthy, parental love includes training. Will be like his teacher. Your children will honour like you honour. Would you like your child's spouse to treat them the way you treat yours? Would you like your daughter's husband to speak to her the way that you speak to your spouse? Because we can talk about the right thing to do, but trust me, they're not looking at what you say so much as what you do. And there has been an honour deficit in the world today. Teach your sons to open doors for women. Don't let mama or big sister take out the trash if there's a man in the house. Teach your sons and daughters to stand up and give a seat to the elderly or an expectant mother or someone who's nursing a child. All these important things. There are many times when I go through life, I'll literally be the door opener because I want people to see this is how it's done. I don't just bust through a door and let it slam behind me. I'm watching. Is somebody else coming out behind me? And and more often than not, young teenage boys will just walk on through, living their best lives. That's an indictment on moms and dads. Are we teaching our sons and daughters how to be honourable and chivalrous? Are we teaching them to say please and thank you. One of the most terrible things that I noticed in moving here to Southern California was how terribly people spoke to wait staff. Oh yeah, give me a give me a give me a cheeseburger, extra cheese, lettuce wrapped, Southern California. <laughs> no thank you. Rude. They're not your slave. What are you teaching your kids? Please and thank you. Eye contact. Don't teach your children to walk into a room and be suspicious of everybody in there. They don't need to walk in and run for president, but they should be able to give eye contact, put out a hand, say hi, introduce themselves, put a smile on their face. I think as Christians, we have an obligation to be happy. I really do. I know in our feelings-obsessed world, that seems disingenuous, but I... If you're a true Christian, you should not be sad all the time. And if you are, then you need to not be a Christian and join Islam or something and go to a religion that better suits your countenance and you can wear a mask all the time and have people control you. But if you're a Christian, let your face know, let your kids know, we got Jesus in our hearts. We're happy. We're going to heaven when we die. We can have the best life. Teach your children to wait without complaining. 
to ask people questions, not to dominate every conversation. Be interested in other people. And then finally, teach your children about God. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 to 7, it it says this. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, not on your mind, on your heart. These are heart commands. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Do you talk about God at home? Do you have your children in church on the weekend? Do you just kind of slide in and slide out and not plant yourself in deep? You're doing your family a disservice. My parents aren't pastors. They've never been pastors, but they knew the benefit of raising their family in a healthy church, of sowing themselves in deep. And not just that, we didn't just turn up to church, church. Church was where our life happened. Our best friends, I met my husband, all the people that we do life with and go on vacation with, these were our people, this was our family. And some of you don't have functional families, but you do now. At least we're not as dysfunctional as the rest of the world. But I, they taught me about God, to hear from God. And we'd have conversations around the table where my parents would talk about us and our relationship with God and tell us the stories of our conception. And I remember as a young girl being told the story about how the doctor said to my mom, because of the serious heart condition you have, you can't have this baby, which was me. You need to terminate this pregnancy. You got three little girls to take care of. But my mom would tell that story and say, but I knew, Leanna, it was a short conversation because I knew you were meant to be here. I've always known I was special. There is something special about your son or your daughter. Are you telling them the story? Are you telling them the story about how that person prophesied that they would be born? Are you sharing those stories about God's goodness and His faithfulness? Because of how my parents trained me, I've never once grappled with the fact that God saw me. I hear sometimes people say, there's so many people in the world, how could God notice me? I've never felt that because of the environment and the atmosphere that my parents created for me and the understanding that God's with me. I don't don't need to be afraid. I can go through anything and know that I'm going to be okay. It's training day, friends. It's training day. Things can be better than they've been. We don't have to watch this generation circle the drain and go down it. We don't have to watch them regress into the most depressed, the most anxious. Maybe we could be partners in the rebirth of the greatest generation to ever live. The greatest generation out of the ashes of 2020, 2021, the birth of the greatest generation, a strong, godly, virtuous, kind, loving, responsible, happy, fun, interesting group of people that have less chance of being wildly dysfunctional. Just close your eyes. Father, I thank you for these beautiful people that you love. God, you know every story. You know every situation. You know the regrets. You know the dilemmas they now face. Father, I thank you that you said to us, if we lack wisdom, we can ask you for it and you will give it to us liberally. Father, give us wisdom to raise your babies today. And for those here who are not raising children of their own currently, Father, open their eyes to the ones that they can step into the gap for. If you're a single mom here today or a single dad and you're thinking, what do I do? I'm doing this alone. That gap can be filled by others, by pastors, by good, godly, healthy men and women. God is going to provide a solution. Father, I thank you right now for your precious kids. Lord God, let us raise your children well. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our locations, team, and what we do here at Awakened Church, go to awakenedchurch.com.